with the specialists, it's kind of not a cool thing to, to coach those guys. You know, there, there's so many different hats that we wear as coaches, and it's, you know, kind of correcting the myth that, like, that's not real football. It, it really is. And I, I believe as competition gets more intense and teams get more evenly matched, your specialists are that much more important to the outcome of the football game. Winning the punting battle, not missing a field goal, not giving up a big play in coverage. You know, those are, those are almost as important to the outcome of the game as making the plays. On today's show, we talk about something I think everybody needs to pay attention to. It's one of those things that you don't know what you don't know sometimes. And this is something I was guilty of, especially as a young coach with specialists. And I see it time and time again. I know on the teams, both that I was a head coach, teams that I was assistant coach, we weren't always the best with how we handled our specialists. And, you know, a lot of those guys, you'd send them off somewhere, they'd do their thing. You really didn't know what they were doing until their period was up and they'd come over and kick the ball. So we want to put some more detail around that and really think about how you can connect your specialist to your special team's schemes. That's an important thing to think about. And joining us today to talk about that is specialist coach and special teams consultant Matt Morin. Matt, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Keith. Really excited to dive into this topic with you. Well, Matt, you got your start in coaching at Bowdoin College, and you finished up before you became a consultant at Stanford. But for you, getting into the profession, what was it at the beginning was really your why for you? Why did you want to do this? Well, I'll tell you what, Keith. I had sort of an injury-riddled college career. You know, I played small college football. I was a 5'9 quarterback. I got beat up a little bit in the pocket there, and I wasn't satisfied with my career when it was over. I felt like I had more to give to the game, and I felt like I could be a lot better coach than I was a player. And I was able to translate that passion as a player into being a coach. And I, I do want to credit my father there, who was a longtime Pop Warner coach, and then successful high school coach, and a now athletic director at a small school in uh, Massachusetts. So I'd say it's in my blood. The opportunity to connect with young men, to be a developer of young men, and to also get out that competitive streak that I had I just couldn't give up the game. I felt like I had so much more to give. I know as we develop as coaches, those things start to evolve, and we have that certainly at the core of why we got into the game. And I know for you, there was a point where you had a revelation about really what brought you to where you are today. So how has that why evolved, and what drives you today? I'd say right now, being in a kind of unique position, coaching specialists privately, working with different small colleges, coaching up their, their coaches on special teams and how to coach the specialists. So it's really driving me right now is being able to translate some of the success we had on the field at Stanford to other programs because we placed such a huge emphasis on it while we were there. And kind of bridging the gap between that world where with the specialists, it's kind of not a cool thing to, to coach those guys. You know, there, there's so many different hats that we wear as coaches and it's, you know, kind of, correcting the myth that like that's not real football it, it really is and I, I believe as competition gets more intense and teams get more evenly matched your specialists are that much more important to the outcome of the football game winning the punting battle not missing a field goal not giving up a big play in coverage you know those are those are almost as important to the outcome of the game as making the plays so really eliminating errors I think is the key to winning football games and I, I think that it as far as a specialist the there's no more important place than that. I know in learning the game, and especially as I was coming up as a coach, man, there were not necessarily a ton of resources you could go to. You know, for me, I got, I'm dating myself. It was like VHS. And so the special teams game, you kind of learned on the fly. You learned from different people. And, and sometimes it would be fragmented information. But for you, what things did you focus on early on in your development as a coach that really helped you learn this part of the game? Well, I would say I was so lucky to be hired at Stanford by Pete Alomar. He's been in the Pac-12 about 35 years, and I was able to kind of stand on the shoulders of a great coach and really spent a few years just listening. My first two years at Stanford, we're in the, well, where our offensive and defensive meetings are happening. I'm in the room watching the biomechanics of kicking, punting, and snapping with somebody who's coached it for, for 35 years. And to be honest, it was turning my brain off to the, the offensive and defensive side of the games and putting 100% of my focus into the mechanics of each of those three unique positions. And then I think you learn a little bit more about 
the biomechanics of those positions when when you've got new guys come in because there's no two kickers that are exactly the same. There's no two punters that are exactly the same. But figuring out how to create a good directional punter, how to create a good directional kickoff guy, how to get a kicker to make 80% of his kicks. I have to really thank Coach Alomar for his you know, mentorship and guidance there and gradually giving me more and more to do each year to the point where I, you know, I felt confident enough that I can go out and do this on my own and do it privately. So I'd have to really thank that. Uh, thank Coach Almar and Coach Shaw at Stanford for, you know, giving us the time and allocating, you know, the resources to have two full-time special teams coaches. You know, it's a rarity in college football. So I'd say that's, that's really where that comes from. Yeah, that's a luxury for most programs at uh, just about every level till you get to the bigger programs is somebody has to learn this stuff and then be the guy who's going to essentially disseminate it to everybody else on the staff whether that's the scheme or why you're doing certain things with your, with your kicker you know kicker seems to be one of those things that guys take an approach to that they they don't know a thing about it so they just stay the heck away from them or they think they know something about it, they maybe know a little, and everybody has input into what's going right or wrong to that guy. But, you know, looking at that part of the game and developing you know, the long snapper, the punter, the kicker, where would you focus right now if you're a young coach getting into this, knowing that uh, I, I really want to dig into special teams and learn more? Uh, what would be the approach for that coach? Well, I'd say you really just have to spend time in the film room and you have to, I, I think it's really a mentorship thing. I mean, to learn the specialist, I think you have to, first of all, talk to people who, and talk to a lot of people who were successful at it, and then hear them actually talk about it in as much detail as possible. You know, like, just talking about a kicker's alignment. Like, you know, you watch kickers just take their steps a lot of times, and they don't line up in the same spot every single time. You know, we always would do an experiment the first day, even with our, our college kickers, guys we offered scholarships to. Take your steps five times, and we would mark the location of where it is and realize that, you know, the guy takes his steps and he lines up in the diff in a different spot five times in a row. And you can't be a consistent player until you line up correctly. And we know that that's a, that's a, an axiom in all of football. So um, I think that you just have to understand that the details of the kicking, punting and snapping position, they're every bit as detailed as playing linebacker or footwork for the quarterback position or a defensive back in his back pedal and how they break on the ball. There's a lot of similarities between the sports of golf and tennis that are especially applicable to kickers, punters, and snappers. So understanding that, first of all, they're three different positions. They all have their own nuances to them, especially how they're linked to what you're doing in your scheme. And I, I think you really kind of have to get with an expert on all three of those and spend as much time in the film room learning the guys on your team and what makes them successful, you know, it, whether it's, you know, my kicker tends to have a closed plant foot or he tends to plant a little bit shallow, which causes them to drive the ball or I have a punter who crosses over on his drive step, which causes them to cross over on his swing. And he tends to hit the ball right to left. You know, there's every kid is a little bit different and you kind of have to coach them a little differently. And that's exactly, you know, the same way we approach the rest of football. So it's not just kick the ball here there are proper ways to approach that. There's mechanics, there's steps, there's routine, there's drills to, to help your guys improve them. So you really have to be willing to, I think, be tenacious with it and realize you, you're going to be the only person who cares about it. Like, you know, the, the head coach just wants to check that box. Like, you know, let's get the punt off. Let's make the kick. Let's make sure we have no bad snaps. How do we do that? I, I think that's the, the most important part is, is being willing to put in the time and effort. I think when you look at these skills and the guy who coaches them, it really starts with the mindset of the coach and the approach that he's going to take. Uh, any of those guys, whether it's it's the punter, the kicker, the long snapper, can get into a situation where they, they have a bad one. You know, they get the shanks if it's the kicker or, or that snapper puts it over his head. And, and now there's that whole mental side and it really becomes the mindset. So when you look at coaching the game and coaching these guys, what's the mindset or approach to the game as a coach that you take? Well, the first thing I'd say is, you know, you only get one shot at fourth down. And that's an attitude that I learned from, from coach Alomar at Stanford. You know, we approached it as if, you know, we called ourselves the snipers there, you know, kind of the, 
one shot, one kill reference back to that old Robert De Niro movie, Deer Hunter, is understanding that every single kick, every single snap, every single punt is a big kick, punt, or snap. And there, every single rep in practice needs to be approached exactly the same way. You only get one chance at this. We don't get another, we don't get another down. Making sure that they understand every kick, punt, snap is a pressure kick. And then really kind of when every, every single play is a pressure play, none of them are because they all become the same, whether it's an extra point or a game winner. And I think the thing that helps those guys do that is routine. They need to warm up exactly the same every single day. Their pre-practice routines need to be the same. Their pre-game routines need to be the same. You know, there's a, there's a saying I learned from uh, our strength coach uh, who was there a long time named Shannon Turley. You don't rise to the occasion. You fall back on your training. And so I think that's what really helps those guys similar to golfers is that, that they develop a consistent routine and they stick to it. And it, it, if it's mechanical, then, then that's fine. But I think that that helps kind of soothe their emotions especially on game day when the bullets are flying. With the situation you guys had at Stanford, and I do think it's a unique one, but I think the approach applies anyway to whatever level you're at and however big of a staff you have, is that you have the ability to lead your players. And I don't know that we always take that approach with the kicker. Sometimes they're thrown in with another group in a position room to watch things. You don't have that guy necessarily. You might have to make time to watch things with them. But nonetheless, you need to be a leader for them. How would you describe yourself as a leader? Well, I'd say, the, the, first of all, from the, from the meta level, the special teams coordinator spends more time in front of the entire team than the head coach, especially in the way we ran things at Stanford. Every day started out with a 30-minute special teams meeting. The special teams coordinator really has the opportunity to be a program builder by echoing the message of the head coach, by being somebody that can motivate and kind of bring people together in terms of how we play the game. For us, it was playing mistake-free physical football where every play mattered. So, you know, I think the special teams coordinator is in a unique position after the strength coach to be somebody who really is the one who brings the guys together. He talks to every player on the team except for the quarterbacks for the most part. So they're kind of in a really unique position there. I'd say in terms of the specialists, I think you treat, you think of yourself as sort of being the caddy and the swing coach. So the swing coach is the person who is helping them with their mechanics throughout practice and developing that. And then on game day, being their caddy. I think it's very difficult to coach technique on game day because the last thing you want these guys to do is overthink things, especially when the emotions are high. So I think understanding how to put your arm around a guy, calm them down, make sure they focus on the routine and the simple, you know, simple assignments and simple words that can help them. I think that that's really the best way to approach it. And, you know, being around, you know, one of the best, uh, that's what I observed on a daily basis. Again, those those specialists seem to take a different role than other players on the team. You're going to look to the quarterback to lead, or you're going to look maybe to that Mike linebacker, or that safety, or you know that emotional guy who's on the defensive line, whatever it might be, to be that leader. But you know, I think leaders are leaders, and it doesn't mean that just because they're in this role as a kicker and you know they're not out there on every down that they shouldn't lead. So. In terms of that, especially with the cult, a strong culture like you guys had at, at Stanford, how do you work with your guys and set them up to be leaders and to be a big part of that culture? Well, I think part of it is in the meeting room is you have to make the entire team, first of all, understand how difficult of a job it is that they have. You know, they spend all of their time, you know, it's like just take a good kicker. 80% is really the gold standard for a kicker. And so, you know, that's, that's eight out of 10. And understanding how hard it is to make eight out of 10 of your kicks, you know, I, I think so. It's on you as a coach, first of all, to, to don't ever let your team get in the mindset of, you know, you, you only have one job. Like, you know, you're, you're just the kicker. Come on. Like, you know, you only come out three plays a game. Like, making the team understand that, that those guys are special and that they're so important to the success. You know, you can do everything right. And if the ball doesn't go through the pipes, so I think it's really important for the coordinator to first set the table and then making sure that those guys work every bit as hard as everybody else on the team and they think of themselves as football players first 
you know, and so I think that can really be established in early morning workouts in the competitive periods that are away from organized football activities, you know, in the winter over the summer and having those guys, you know, be attentive and take notes in meetings, you know, and, and really making sure that, that they are not treated any differently and that they are expected to work every bit as hard and be just as tough as, as the other guys on the team, the position players. So I'm interested in, in getting into a little bit of what you guys would do in that room. You and, and Coach Alomar had nine guys, position meetings, and what were you guys doing to uh, make those guys successful at their jobs? What is it that you handle in the classroom? I'm sure you, you watch a lot of the kicks. You're going to understand the mechanics, but it's not just all the technique. We, we'll get into it a little bit. Uh, this This does tie into scheme too, but... How are you setting your guys up to be successful in that in that meeting room or classroom? So the first thing would be in pre-practice, we're going to show the drills that we're going to be doing that day. And just like you would run an indie period for the running backs or for the offensive line, is we're showing them examples of people doing it correctly, people doing it incorrectly, and then showing their film, you know, maybe from the previous day or from, you know, the previous spring. So it's approaching it with every bit the amount of detail as, you know, uh, as a quarterback would approach it. And then talking about, you know, the mindset of how we execute that job and how we stay locked in during practice. And then we were, you know, lucky enough to have a low camera that would follow us throughout practice. And we would have, you know, the film schedule that we were going to set up, you know, during, during, you know, cause our indie periods would be, you know, really an hour and 20 minutes of the, of a practice. And then, it would be going back in and, and taking the, the field back to the film room and going back and reviewing it. And also, though, spending time in developing mindset, like you talked about before, we would read some really great books. Uh, one that I recommend is called The Inner Game of Tennis. Mm-hmm. It's a book about, uh, I'm sure you've probably heard of it. It's a, it's a book about mindfulness, you know, based on, you know, somebody who's learning how to serve in tennis or somebody else learning, you know, tennis technique and how to, how to moderate yourself so you don't go down these negative spirals of, you know, when you talk about when guys have the shanks, like I stink, I can't do this. It's eliminating negative self-talk. So it's a way of kind of empowering those guys to, to be able to, to let go of being results based and be more process based, you know, and trusting that if your process is, is approached correctly and you, you execute your process that the results will take care of themselves. When you look at your approach to coaching, your methodology, how you're going to handle drills, how you coach them up on the field, how you give feedback, et cetera, what is it you feel you do and do well in being able to help your players reach their full potential? Well, I think the, the, co- the phrase that I learned from Coach Shaw would be demanding but not demeaning. I think that we, we can demand the highest level of execution from our guys while also not making them feel bad about it when they don't do it correctly. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we have to remember that these are high school kids or they're college kids and really they're kids. You know, your brain doesn't stop developing until you're 25. And these guys are, they all want to be good. And I think that when they don't execute their job, making them feel bad about it is, is counterproductive. Now, I'm not saying don't coach your guys hard, but I mean, that, I think that all comes down to developing rapport with your players, developing a relationship so that you can coach them hard. And then it's, you know, understanding that when they don't do it right, you're not attacking them as a human being. You're just trying to motivate them to be the best that they can be. If we were to grab one of your former players, how would they describe you as a coach? I'd say probably honest. You know, I try to have fun at practice. I really, I like to crack a lot of jokes. Um, I feel like that kind of loosens guys up a little bit to give them, you know, sort of feedback is keep things a little bit loose, but focus like, you know, it, it's okay to have lighter moments at practice, but then we have to reel it back in and, you know, and really lock into the details of our assignment. So I'd say, yeah, honest and loose. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be direct with guys if I don't think that they're they're on it today. If I don't think they're giving great effort, I'm going to tell them. But I also expect them to be able to to tell me in return, like, Coach, you know, today's been a hard day. I'm I'm trying my best here, and understand that we're all going to have good days and bad days. And you know, again, just developing that rapport. Being, you know, I, I don't want to say that I hate the phrase "players coach," but I mean, really relating to the guys as human beings, 
first and then football players second. I know in coaching today, the tools that we have obviously are a big part of helping these guys reach their full potential for you. What's what tool or tools do you use that are indispensable for you uh, doing your job at an elite level? Well, it's going to be something pretty small, but uh, honestly, having an iPad on the field when you're working with yeah. kickers, punters, and snappers is something I've found to be huge because after they hit a kick, if I'm standing behind them or one of the other specialists is staying behind them filming it with an iPad, they can watch it in real time. You know, they just missed the kick wide right. They come back and say, hey, what do you think you did? And they're like, you know, coach, I'm really not sure. We put the film on, oh, your plant foot was a little bit closed, so your hips were aimed out to the right. Okay, great, I'll correct that on the next rep. So coaching specialist, I think you should have some sort of filming device that you can watch immediately, whether it's an iPhone or an iPad or something like that. That's been an indispensable tool for me, and I, I think even for small colleges, having the guys be able to coach themselves using that that technology that's available it's available to us is huge absolutely you know when i was at baldwin wallace and i was the offensive coordinator nothing to do with the specialists but i started bringing my ipad out on the field and this is before the 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 rules changed and allowed you know instant replay on the sidelines for high school Uh, but initially you know i started looking at that stuff and i imagined like how how might i i best coach these guys and what can we do to get them better feedback instant feedback instead of waiting for the film room and so it was the ipad and started bringing that thing onto the field and you know we would have a position student coach just in different positions depending on the period or drill working with those we get our inside run and then usually we had a special teams period and our o-line would go over and watch the inside run on the field before they would go back to team and, you know, try to correct some of those mistakes there. But then the kickers right away, coach, can we borrow the iPad? Can we borrow the iPad? And they were, they were using it like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I agree. It's, you know, when you look at, I don't think people do it enough. Uh, I, I'm surprised that, you know, I always say if I was at the high school level and I had that technology, I'd be figuring out how to use it in practice as well. And I had it actually uh, through, you know, writing and talking about different products. I had one called Coach's Eye who gave me that for a season, and I had it through my phone to my iPad, right? We had it set up that way. Student assistant took my phone, filmed the play. A couple seconds later, I'm looking at the play while the other, you know, next play is being signaled in, and I'm able to give feedback on the run to these guys, what they're doing right or wrong. And, you know, that kind of stuff, I think, allows you to do your job well. So, yeah, I I agree with you 100% there. Yeah, it's been, it was really big. And, uh, you know, as I coach guys privately now, you know, who are still developing high school kids, it's that instant feedback is just so important. Because what you got to understand, you know, these guys have to be able to self-correct. Yeah. It, it's really hard to coach them on game day. And for, for the most programs, they don't have somebody who's checking in with them on the on the regular. So being able to know what you did wrong and, you know, having a guess coming back looking at the film, oh, that's what it is that helps those guys so much after like two years, they don't even need the iPad. They're like, yep, coach, I planted shallow on that. Or I crossed over on my steps or I dropped inside on my, on my drop as a punter, you know? So it, yeah, it's, it's huge in players developing the ability to be more self-aware. So before you hit the practice field, do you personally have a routine for yourself to get ready to do all the things you need to do in practice to be on top of your game so that everything is running smoothly? Absolutely. I would like to run through the practice schedule one time in my head, go over the practice maps real quick, you know, because part of my job was making sure that all of the coaches were on the same page. And so I would like to go around individually and check in with every single coach that was responsible for a special teams drill. And that would make me kind of feel good about, you know, what we were doing that day and that everything was organized. You know, organization is the biggest part of coaching special teams. And you're working with so many moving parts. So I would say just like making sure you check in with everybody who was involved before practice starts, you know, an hour, two hours before. Coach, are you okay with what everything that's going on today? Is there any final questions? Do you know where you're lining up on the field today? Do you know where you're orienting your players so that the film angle angle is proper? And then for me, real quick, after that's over, I would go downstairs and I'd hit the Versa Climber for 10 minutes or, you know, the Rogue Bike just to kind of get a little bit of that stress and anxiety out and then – uh you know, get a, get a nice little lather going and then go hit the field. How about game day? What's the routine for you there? I think game day is just projecting as much of a relaxed attitude as possible, you know, making sure that the guys see that you're confident. 
having final meetings where you go over the, the key tips and reminders for all six phases. Uh, that was something we did that was huge. And, uh, you know, getting the guys feeling really confident about what they're doing. And then, you know, just, just walking around the field, making sure guys aren't taking too many reps in pregame. And then as the game approaches, just remind them, hey, this is something that we've done before. This is practice. And, uh, you know, we're just repeating, you know, what we do and, you know, making, making them understand that they've already done this successfully, you know, the, the week leading up. You mentioned 8 out of 10 being the gold standard, that that's what you want out of a, a kicker. What is it that you do out on the field, you know, whether it's the progressions or how you do things, what are the keys to getting him to that 8 out of 10? Well, I'd say the first thing is alignment, as we talked about before. You can't be a consistent kicker until you line up in the same spot every single time. I'd say the next thing is is having a consistent plant uh, as a kicker. Your hips are directed in the direction of the instep of your plant foot. So, you know, it's the way that we walk. You know, we, we walk, you know, unless somebody is duck footed, that's a, that's a whole other topic of conversation. But for the most part, most athletes, their, their insteps point directly ahead of them and getting your kicker to understand that until he develops a consistent plant and a consistent alignment, he can't be a consistent kicker. So it's holding them to that standard and, and getting them to be as repeatable as possible. Um, and the other thing is also, you know, on uh, your follow through tells you so much about, you know, your approach to the ball um, if your hips don't finish between the pipes it, it's really hard to to consistently hit the ball straight and I would also say like don't watch other kickers obsessively you know especially in the NFL they, you know those guys are the best of the best and a lot of them haven't really been coached that hard over the course of their lives they most of them have kind of developed their own swing have had little tweaks here and there but become an um, an expert of your own swing first before you start looking at other guys and you know tinkering is something that a lot of specialists want to do they want to make all these little changes all the time well because i saw justin tucker doing this you're not justin tucker you know you're not adam venetary you are yourself and become the best you before you worry about all these other guys so i'd say just like quieting down the amount of information that these guys are taking in and having a consistent voice in their head just like you would for a quarterback, you know, one voice in their head all the time. I think that's the way to get them to be consistent. Coaching cues, your language are such an important part of the game and and developing the, that vocabulary, that terminology you're going to use with them is important to coaching them, especially in, in those high tempo situations out on the field. You don't want to waste time. So what are the coaching cues or buzzwords that your players hear again and again and why are those so important to you? If it relates to the specialists, uh, I'd say punters, short, tall, and smooth. You know, the shorter your steps are, the easier it is to get up through the ball and generate hang time. By staying smooth, it, we stay in control. You know, I, something to just talk about in terms of, you know, swing velocity. It, it's really hard to control a car if you're driving it as fast as it can possibly go. You know, driving a driving your, your Honda Civic there, 100. 125 miles an hour you're probably going to crash but if you drive that thing at 80 percent of its capacity you can control it so um, 80 is the new 100 hear that all the time heard that from coach alomar forever understanding that you know kicking and punting is about contact it's not about how hard you swing because you can't control your swing or your finish if you're you're constantly going 100 percent of the time another thing about that too is if you're you're always swinging as hard as you can you're going to get injured you know over the course of a season you know, you're, if you're averaging 35 points a game, that means you're hitting at least seven kickoffs. You know, you're you're hitting your warm-ups before the game. You're hitting your kicks at halftime. Then there's all the extra points, and you might attempt some field goals. I mean, by the middle of the third quarter, your legs are going to be hanging off. So, and then imagine by week seven. So, mm -hmm. uh, 80 is the new hundred is another is another phrase. You know, you if you you got to be able to make consistent contact at 80 percent before you're allowed to swing harder than that. For you, what's the key to giving feedback that produces a positive change in performance? I'd say the key is a word I used a little bit earlier. It's rapport. Um, mm -hmm. The key to receiving criticism, or, or excuse me, delivering criticism to a player is you have to have the rapport already built with them. You know, otherwise, especially in this day and age, our players are going to take that as a personal attack. Mm -hmm. I hear play, people call it people call it disrespect. People call it 
you know, coach doesn't like me. Um, they're not actually listening to the message because they're thinking it's coming from a place of, you know, you're, as if you're talking down to them. So I think the key to really developing a player and having them be open to criticism is developing a rapport where they know that you care about them as a person. You've connected with them on multiple levels that are away from the football field, whether that's through the recruiting process, through, you know, having them over for dinner in the off season was something our staff I think was really great about. And then connecting with them on a personal level it's during stretch line or whatever it is in pre practice, you know, doing a little, you know, checking in with them or joking around. I think that goes a long way when it comes time to, to really be serious and tell them, hey, this is an area of the game that really needs to improve and you, you need to do it now. So um, rapport, for sure. You talked to me before about the important part of this being that these specialists get connected to the special teams scheme. Talk to me about how you do that as a coach and also why that's so important. Yeah, so let's just think of the example of being a directional punt team. Having everybody understand that if we're walking to our left as a punter and the snapper gives us a ball on the back right hip, it's really hard for that punter to get the ball all the way back across and out to the left sideline um, when he's walking. So letting the gunner know that so that they can kind of hold each other accountable. The next thing is, is in those meetings, when you're meeting with the punt team, you know, you're making everybody understand that if we get a good snap, the punter walks his line and what the expected hang time and distance is of that particular kick that's going to allow that gunner to force a fair catch. So I think it's like connecting all the dots between the pieces, you know, having people understand that if we, we have a really great specialist and that if we protect him well back there and make him comfortable, he's going to produce a positive impact to the game. So understanding the, the punting duel, you know, coming in on, on Sunday or Monday, whenever it is you meet after your game and saying like, hey, here's how our punter performed versus them. It's because of you guys. And look, we gained 80 yards in this game and hit in field position yards. You know, that's a touchdown. That's worth a touchdown. And then praising that guy in front of everybody and getting them excited about when your punter hits a great punt. You know, getting the, the, the gunners that you put in, you know, when you're punting from around the 50-yard line or in, you know, who are trying to keep the ball out of the end zone and, and having them take pride in their job and understanding hey, that connects to start of drive for our defense. You know, the difference between starting at the four versus the nine-yard line is monumental. We're taking the offense out of their normal, you know, uh, drive starting game plan. Now they're in their backed up series. So it's like just connecting the specialist to the special teams, then to the, the, you know, the next possession really helps your players understand, you know, how important the specialists are in terms of the context of the overall game. So, we're just all, we're not separating into offense, defense, and special teams. We're all just one team playing one game versus, you know, offense versus defense versus special teams. We're all in this together. When you look at the special teams and, as you said, the context of the game, it seems that the rarest of situations always come up in special teams, whether that is, and it's not at the college level, but at the high school pro level, you know, a fair catch and a free kick. We saw this past year, right, in, in, in a, a kickoff kick return, that straddle return where the guy straddles a line and then it's out of bounds and there's a flag thrown. So how do you prepare your guys for that part of it, those rare situations so they know when uh, those might come up exactly what to do? So we were a team that walked through on Thursdays and then had a fast, short practice on Friday that was full speed, you know, but shortened down and then would play the game on Saturday. So those Thursday walkthroughs were really when we focused on situational football. Um, it, you know, the game plan is already in. We called it no sweat Thursday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, during the, the 30 or so special teams minutes that we would have to walk through stuff, that would be when we would practice our special situations. And those would be the things that we would remind them about every single week and then on Fridays, you know, one of the things I think we did the best was having guys stand up and give the game plan and also what the little nuances are of each, each thing. Like you talked about straddling the sideline on a ball, on a pooch kick that's hit, you know, uh, hit close to the sideline. So all of those little things, you know, by the time your guys are juniors, if they've heard it for two and three years, it becomes second nature. So um, I'd say that, you know, any walkthrough, time that you have is a really great time to introduce those 
unique situations, whether it's, you know, after a safety, you're, you're putting your punt returners out there versus your kickoff returners because you need to go watch, are they going to use a kicker or a punter, you know, in that situation. So Thursdays are great for that. You've given us a lot of detail here today, and I appreciate that. But when you look at all the things as you do as a coach on or off the field, what would be the one thing you point to that gives your players the winning edge? Honestly, I think it's really knowing that you care about them as people. I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but you know, I, I've heard a lot of – I've seen things over the years where players turn on coaches. They think that the, you know, the coaches – not being fair to them. I, I think really just constantly checking in with your guys. You know, we have a great running backs coach at Stanford named Ron Gould, and, you know, he's produced, I, I mean, I don't know how many NFL running backs and fullbacks. I'm, it's it's over 10, if not 15. And I've never seen a coach that has does more about relating to his players, making sure that they know that he loves each and every one of them, um, and just constantly checking in with them on and off the field and not letting them, you know, do anything but their best. You know, uh, Coach Gould has a very uh, fatherly, you know, sort of approach to coaching. And I think that's really how how we should approach it, is understanding that these are kids first. You know, even though they might be 6'6", 315 pounds, the guy's still 19, 20 years old. And we need to approach it like, you know, they're still an unfinished product. And we, we are in such a pivotal time in their development to, to help them be functional, mature, kind, but also successful leaders as young men. So I'd say, again, it's about rapport and honesty and uh, letting your guys know that you care about them. Well, I know you're out there doing work with coaches. What would be the best way for our listeners to connect with you? So my Twitter handle, Matt underscore Moran underscore, DMs are open. I would love to chat with anybody anybody about special team scheme, organization, or, you know, coaching the specialist position. And then I also have my website, www.specopsst.com. The company that I started is called Spec Ops Special Teams Training and Clinics. I've worked with a couple of small college staff so far in the the first few months I've been doing this. Um, It's been a really fun time, and and I'm open to, uh, to anybody, you know, no matter the level to have a conversation. And uh, again, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to to talk about this. It's something I'm very passionate about. Um, and as an area of the game that I hope that we can continue growing as coaches, the approach to special teams and coaching the specialists. And uh, yeah, this has been a unique opportunity to talk about it. And uh, again, very, very grateful for the opportunity. Well, thank you for taking the time and Certainly would love to have you back sometime, maybe to dig in deeper on just one single concept that might help coaches. But thank you for all you shared today and I look forward to talking to you in the future. All right. Thanks a lot, Keith. Appreciate it.